Hello, I'm Peter Moore, and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're off to the 1960s and the politics of post-imperial Britain. In a well-known photograph taken in February 1945, Winston Churchill, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Joseph Stalin sit cheerfully together at the conference in Yalta. The war is very nearly won and the so-called Big Three have gathered to discuss what the peacetime world will look like. For all his good humour, this would become a haunting photograph for Churchill. He knew that no longer could Britain sit alongside the two superpowers. With her finances ruined by the war and her empire disintegrating, post-war Britain was going to be a very different kind of country to that of Churchill's youth. But what kind of country? As the historian Philip Stevens points out in his new book Britain Alone, the answer to that simple question has proved stubbornly elusive. From Suez to Brexit, from Anthony Eden to David Cameron, generations of British politicians have tried to define the nation's place in the world, but few of them with any lasting success. In this episode, Stevens takes me back to one of the telling months in this long and turbulent story. Britain alone has been described as an instant classic by the historian Peter Hennessy. We do have a couple of copies to give away, so keep listening to the end to find out how you can be in with a chance of winning one. Otherwise... Enjoy. Welcome, Philip Stevens, to Travels Through Time to talk about your book, Britain Alone, which is nothing if not timely. I was looking at the news yesterday and it said the UK's chief Brexit negotiator has criticised the EU for its actions since the trade deal agreed by the two sides came into force six weeks ago. David Frost said the relationship has been more than bumpy over the past few <laughs> weeks i'm I can, I can hear a little bit of a mirthful laugh yes because really you've you've charted this relationship much further back in the last few weeks really back to um suez and the second world war i think it'd be really nice if you just began by telling us a little bit about britain alone in your own words and what drove you to the writing of it I suppose I'd say that the book's the story of um, Britain's uh, struggle to find its place in the world after the end of the Second World War and the dissolution of empire. It's a story essentially, I suppose, about exalted ambition. You know, how do we hold on to our greatness? We can't keep the empire, but surely we can remain a, a great power. But that colliding with economic and political circumstance, um, the US and the Soviet Union taking over the soup as the superpowers and others catching up with our economy um, and us struggling to finance uh, these overseas commitments that made us a, uh, a global power. So, so it's sort of ambition colliding with um with straightened economic circumstance and in that there's a sort of collision as well between self-identity and global ambition it was summarized very well by this uh, uh by an american statesman dean atchison who famously accused us of of losing an empire and failing to find a role um the reason i wrote it well i've been writing about these issues in one way or another for the last 40 years, I'm afraid to say. A short period of that time for Reuters in Brussels and since for Reuters in London and traveling around the world. And it's always struck me that we we try to make these false choices. Are we Atlanticist? Are we you know, pro-American or are we pro-European? Are we global or are we European? I'm not a pessimist about Britain. I think we're a great country, but we struggled to find a, somewhere to sort of fit in. And I came across a few years ago uh, the 
quotation that I start the book with was uh, the chief scientist for the Ministry of Defence uh, in 1949, a chap called Henry Tizard, a very interesting man. But he said in 1949, you know, and this was a sort of plea to his colleagues and to the politicians, he said, look, we're a great nation, but we're no longer a great power. And if we continue to try to behave like a great power, the risk is we'll cease to be a great nation. Mm. And that struggle between great power, great nation um, has fascinated me. So I suppose Brexit in its way was was the trigger to write it because it struck me as a sort of bookend for this search. One was Suez, which in the end tipped us into Europe and Brexit takes us out. And we're in a, in a, in a funny way, we're back to where we started yeah. um, in this world of power blocks of you know, the United States and China and economically, at least, the uh, European Union, where does this, you know, sizable nation with lots of talents and skills, but a sizable nation on the edge of Europe, where do we fit in? It's it's such a fascinating question. And one of the, the recurring themes, especially throughout the early part of the book, but you might actually make the case right up to today, is this, I suppose, coming to terms that Britain's like kind of going through collectively of its loss of empire? I remember being, you know, at school in the 1980s and they still had these globes, which must have been produced in the 1930s. So goodness knows why they had survived quite so long. But these, the, these were the globes where, you know, a quarter of the land mass was coloured in pink. Pink. Yes. In particular, I mean, it's maybe interesting in itself why those objects remained in the classroom so long, why they were not updated. You can maybe um, think about that. But there's another, like, kind of early um, in in the book, you you kind of make frequent reference to the big three, which is a fallacy. But it comes from that famous old photograph at Yalta with Churchill, Stalin. And Roosevelt at Yalta, and there's one at Potsdam as well, where it's Truman, uh, Stalin, and Churchill. Exactly, but it's it's a you know a kind of it's a comforting photograph for Churchill, but it's not a projection or an authentic projection of the reality of power as soon as the war has ended. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. I mean, you know, we we won the war as it were, of course, the Soviet Union and the United States did play their parts. But in our in our self-consciousness, we won the war. And we had, you know, not only did we win the war, but we'd stood alone when everyone else had given up. Uh, we decided to battle on. So that sense that we were victors crashed into the reality that one the war had bankrupted us. Before the war, we had been huge net creditors with sort of, if you like, investments and cash stashed around the world. All of a sudden, we were a debtor. We needed cash. And secondly, the empire was crumbling. India would go within two years of the war, and that would be the beginning. So as victors, we felt, of course, that we, you know, we should be sitting there at the top table. But the reality was that our power, and in the end, all geopolitical power is based on economic strength, was seeping away. But Attlee and his foreign secretary, Bevin, they too sort of thought, well, look, we'll rebound from the economic shock of the war. You know, our, our technological skills, our engineers, our scientists will sort of bring us back. And it wasn't really until, and that's why the book, I suppose, starts with Suez. It wasn't really until the shock of Suez and the defeat mm. uh, at the hands, not so much of the Egyptians, but the Americans who forced us to stop fighting. That was the big shock that, if you like, led us to say, OK, but only quietly, sort of watching, perhaps we're not a great power. Perhaps we better think about some something else. Is there another construct? to uh in, mm. through which we can retain our influence there's a really nice and intriguing um early conception of britain's post-war identity as a greece to america's rome could you tell me a little bit about that please yeah it, it's a great it's a great phrase and it was um actually coined by harold Macmillan, not 
in his uh, days as a politician, but when he was um, serving in uh, North Africa in the war. And already it was clear that, you know, America was taking over the war. And the question was, how does Britain make sure that its view of how the conflicts being fought um, would prevail? And so Macmillan came up with this idea, you know, say, well, look, you know, we'll be Greece to America's Rome. We'll be, in this metaphor, the smart Greeks, the clever people who come up with the ideas which are then taken on board by the not so clever Romans stroke Americans. So we'll be the advisors whispering in their ear. And this became post-war, if, if you like, a, a strategy to, OK, if we can't hold on to our power by sitting as an equal at the top table, we'll hold on to our power by being the big influencer in, in the US. We'll get the Americans to do what we want, so and we'll pursue our national interests through being the most important voice in Washington. And Macmillan, who, you know, after Suez became a, a prime minister, developed this into this concept of, um, he, he dressed it up in something called interdependence, that in this world, that uh, in this new world, everyone would have to, um, to work together. In the way he posed it, we were equals. Of course, the Americans took a rather more hard-headed view of this, and they were happy to have um, uh, a solid, loyal British ally. Um, but they always saw the, the relationship as asymmetric and more than once uh, demonstrated that by um, operating in, in their interests rather than ours. But this was the special relationship. Churchill had meant, talked about the special relationship uh, actually as far back as the 30s, and he'd resurrected it after the war. But it came became part of the sort of theology, as it were, mm. after Suez, when we decided that you know our future lay with with being best friends with the Americans. Yeah, but what we're going to do now is um, really like focus on a particular part of the story in a particular year and actually you've gone further than that um which is very admirable and you're you're going to give us three scenes in one particular month which kind of bring out some of the themes that you write about in britain alone can you tell us please what year you would like to go and have a look at i'd look at 1962 i think probably just broadly should we talk about 1962 in a um, in a general sense, before we get specific, this is a time of coming change, if that's not too much of a cliche. A lot of the old things from the old world are still there, but they're feeling quite outmoded. In 1962, across the country, there's rather a sort of, you know, there's an energy about Britain, which has, has followed through from uh, the end of the 50s. Um, into the 60s and an economic sort of mini economic boom engineered by Macmillan in order to win himself uh, re-election uh, in 1959 and which it did and you know we remember talking about we've never had it so good yeah. and in one sense it was that it was that world there'd been a huge housing boom through the 50s where you know, here's an example of governments can actually do things when they put their minds to it. They built hundreds of thousands of new houses, houses with um, inside toilets and bathrooms, houses which were equipped to to take all the new consumables, you know, TVs, washing machines, and actually even a new system of finance uh, called HP or higher purchase, where mm. which allowed people to to buy things. So it was the beginning of a of the sort of consumer age, but it was also you know the growth of rock and roll, of what was to become pop music, a generation of people no longer going into national service, wanted to grow their hair. So there was a there was a vibrancy, art schools, of fashion. And a certain optimism, which indeed Harold Wilson would harness um, a couple of uh, years later by, you know, promoting Labour as the party of the future and the white heat of technology. So it's it's the sort of post Sputnik, post, uh, you know, it's the space age, the missile age. Mm. 
so a mixture i would say well for, for the country a mixture of you know quite exciting ambition but with some problems already showing themselves economically and politically that's a tremendous overview let's go to the first of the three scenes you've chosen where would you like to go first please well we're going to um cross the atlantic um for for this one and um we're going to go to the uh, west point uh, military academy in the united states for this and the reason I've chosen these three scenes is that I think that if you, when we put them together, they sort of crystallize the tensions and the challenges in this quest for a, for a, a, a post-imperial role. So the, the first scene is this chap, Dean Acheson, who'd been uh, Secretary of State to um, Harry Truman in the war, one of the uh, far-sighted American politicians uh, responsible for encouraging the integration of Europe, supporter of the Marshall Plan, supporter of the fledgling common market. He didn't work for Kennedy. He was still, you know, by then, the young Jack Kennedy's in the White House. And Acheson, you know, was the sort of person you'd, you know, who spoke to the president when he wanted to speak to the president, as it okay. were. Um, so he was a man still of um, influence, someone who's listened to. And he gave a speech um, on the 6th of December to the, to the sort of passing out parade at West Point, which is, I suppose, the equivalent of our Sandhurst. Mm. And the speech was actually about the whole transatlantic relationship, the relationship with Europe, with the fledging NATO, the standoff with the Soviet Union. This has been the year of the Cuban crisis and, you know, where the West and America had been really tested. But in it... Uh, he chose to direct a few well-chosen sentences towards his um, British friends. And he was an Anglophile. This was not, he was not a, uh, an enemy of Britain. Um, and they were said in a friendly, blunt but friendly sort of warning, as it were. And he used this famous sentence that um, Britain has lost an empire, but has yet to found a role. And that came after he looked at the various roles that he thought we were trying to play. You know, he talked about us trying to play the role of best friend to the US, special relationship, us trying to play the role as uh, head of the Commonwealth, so with our own sort of global network and global power base, and indeed us trying to play the role of mediator between the two superpowers, Moscow and Washington. And what he said was, look, you know, all these roles, they're about played out. And uh, what he was really saying underneath this was that Britain is part of Europe and it better get on and join this common market thing and be mm -hmm. part. The, the Americans were very keen on dealing with the United Europe. Now, this caused an absolute furore yeah. in London, uh, particularly the, well, it was the Tory press went completely mad. And Daily Express you know, had a front page. Uh, headline stab in the back mm. uh, so there was uproar and Macmillan felt he had to rebut this so he um, he actually sent a letter uh, to uh, Lord Chandos there was a con construct so he could put out a statement saying this is a mistake that all sorts of people you know including Napoleon have made through the ages but don't underestimate the Brits um, um. it hurt it struck home because Macmillan and others knew that it had more than a grain of truth. Mm. And actually that night, uh, Macmillan wrote in his diary, of course, he, he says of Atchison, uh, of course, he was always a conceited ass, he said. But then he reflects, but on the other hand, we ought to be strong enough ourselves to laugh off this sort of thing. And Macmillan actually had already decided that we had to be part of the common market. So he knew that Atchison was right, but of course he couldn't, you know, he couldn't accept those phrases. Was the relationship with the Americans exclusive or was it going to be part of a broader architecture? I suppose that clarifying view of the outsider in a way, and you might say that the Americans weren't dispassionate outsiders, but here in Britain, it's maybe more difficult to make sense of your place to, um, you know, like kind of, at close hand than it is yeah. 
for them. I mean, it's, it's quite amusing to read actually this section in the book and just how much of a, I don't know, a thorn it was, or it, it was more than that. It really, really aggravated the newspaper editors for sure, but they were obviously tapping into the national sentiment. Partly we'd made so much of being, you know, best friends with the Americans. And so, but yeah, you're right. And, and in fact, Kennedy, there was such uproar that Kennedy actually called Macmillan to assure him that he hadn't talked to Atchison beforehand. And this, you know, he had, Atchison hadn't been put up to this. Well, that was going to be my question, because occasionally, and I'm sure you know the inner workings of, of politicians, but occasionally someone will be sent out to say something for uh, maybe the purposes of um, negotiation or to make a point or to exert some pressure. Or do you think that like applies in this case, or was he really just expressing a point of view the americans were trying to were beginning to treat us as part of europe um, a couple of months earlier robert mcnamara the then defense secretary had given a speech about um nuclear weapons uh, of course we had we were the only country then with our own uh, deterrent and the only, only european saying look you know there shouldn't be separate countries in europe shouldn't have nuclear deterrence there should be one pan-European deterrent as part of NATO. So that had been taken as a sort of affront because part of our identity crisis, I was going to say, was this sense that there was Europe, and Churchill has said this, um, we're with Europe, but we're not of it. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to be seen as, of course, European, but slightly above, one rung up, as it were. And the idea that the Americans would were treating us on the same level as the the French and indeed, you know, beginning the Germans, stung. So it wasn't part of a concerted plan, but it was certainly a reflection of the feelings of the American political establishment, including within the Kennedy White House. Yeah, and there's a further irony here that you bring out in the book to this moment in particular, because as Macmillan well knew as he sat down to write that diary entry, all that was being said was really only a verification of everything he'd been told by the civil servants who'd worked on this future policy study for him over the past few years, who'd, who'd come up with much of the same arguments. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. That's why it stung, because in the end, Macmillan in his heart at least, had to admit that uh, Atchison was articulating, albeit in you know, rather brutal terms, the sort of arguments that one Norman Brooke, the cabinet secretary and the civil servants had made to him, and two, that he, in, a, in, in this curious way, was trying to make to the country in his effort to persuade the country that we should join the common market and that although we were close to the Americans, we couldn't afford to be left behind by the French and the Germans. So this is the first week of December in 1962. Where are we going to go from there to your second scene, please? Well, we're going to the second week of... Um, this was a busy month. Or a busy, this, for, for Macmillan, this was a busy pre-Christmas um, three weeks. Because, I know, I was thinking um, we could almost title this episode Macmillan's Busy Month, because it's <laughs> pretty much what it is. Yeah, that's, so he, um, a week later, um, Macmillan, he's off for a two-day summit with the general, uh, with Charles de Gaulle, to persuade de Gaulle that Britain should indeed be uh, accepted as a member of the common market. Now, he'd applied uh, a year and a half earlier. There'd been negotiations going on at technical level, really, but uh, led on the British side by, in fact, Edward Heath, who would uh, eventually uh, uh, take us in to the common market. And they'd been going on. And the French had been pretty much very difficult. There was a sense, the British had the sense that, you know, uh, Adenauer, the German chancellor, and then the, the Belgians, the Dutch, and the Luxembourgers and the Italians were all pretty happy, you know, given the right terms that we should join. Um, but the French were being difficult and obstructive. Now, Macmillan, who'd known de Gaulle again uh, during the war, you know, thought he could um, charm and persuade him. And uh, in fact, a couple of months earlier in October, he'd uh, 
had invited him to his uh, house in Sussex, Birch Grove, for a sort of uh, a couple of days of um, softening up. Um, but uh, sadly, that hadn't worked. So now on the 14th of December, he had uh, gone to Rombeweer to for a, a last big effort to to get de Gaulle to think about the big politics of this and drop his objections in the hope that negotiations could then, the technical negotiations would all be unblocked. And in the first half of, uh, of 63, we could um, be accepted for membership. Yeah, I'm just thinking here about de Gaulle and his kind of vital contribution to this point of the story, because his attitudes towards... Britain had been shaped over a very long time, pre predominantly during the years of war. But you write at one point how he often cited an exchange that he had with Churchill on the eve of the Normandy landings, that if Britain ever had to choose between Europe and the open sea, Churchill had admitted she must always choose the open sea. And that's a nice little vignette that clarifies his suspicion of Britain in Europe, isn't it? It is, and it does it absolutely captures the um, the French view. I mean, de Gaulle was a complicated fellow, uh, a man with, a, one might say, certain pride, if not arrogance, a man who'd appreciated, a leader who'd appreciated the help he'd received um, during the war from the British, but equally deeply resented the way he'd been treated, he, so he thought, in the war by the British, not allowed um, to be part of the big decisions, locked out of the Yalta meetings and the Potsdam meetings, so a sort of second-class citizen. So you have this, and as you know, the man who had rescued France in 1958. So you have this person who is um, extremely powerful, proud of France, as anyone is as proud of Britain, and you know it's this this old age-old relationship between France and um, Britain, you know, they it's often called, we were the, we, we've been through the centuries, the best of enemies. Mm. And so there's that tension set up, but there is also a, a geopolitical point here, if you like, after, you know, Suez was an Anglo-French enterprise and the French had the same reasons as us for, to, to go into Suez to sort of prove they could be a global power. They remain, prove that they remained a global power. And we both got a bloody nose. But our response was to rush back to the Americans and say, look, we won't do this again. The French reaction to Suez was to say, essentially, unless we want to be dominated by the Americans, we have to build Europe. Not against the Americans, but as a competitor as an equal to America. And here was de Gaulle's great suspicion that Britain was the Trojan horse for the Americans. Yeah, that's right. If you let Britain into, into the common market, it, you'd be basically opening the door for the Americans to dominate. I think then, having set it up, you should tell us how this meeting concluded. The meeting went badly. Macmillan who afterwards would say, you know, one of the things that he um, he found particularly uh, galling was how as difficult as they were and as obstructive as they were, the French were absolutely uh, polite and respectful in the way that they treated him. But basically, de Gaulle, in fairly brutal terms, made it clear that he was not going to accept British membership of the of the common market and for the reason that he would sub subsequently give a month later when he exercised publicly his veto that Britain was not a, not ready to tear itself away <laughs> from its dependency on the US. Now there were other things as well you know de Gaulle was worried about Commonwealth competition, food competition for French farmers and that. But the central political point was 
he didn't believe that Britain was ready to break with the Americans. And he was right in that. He basically sent Macmillan away with um, uh, with a big no, although not yet admitted, because at that stage, de Gaulle still wasn't quite sure about um, being seen as, as, as uh, obstructing the whole thing. But as Macmillan said afterwards, with extreme courtesy and good manners, he basically showed Macmillan the door. And... Macmillan fumed. I mean, again, um, he thought part of this, you know, there was reason in part of this, but again, he thought it was about France being, as he said, you know, jealous. It was jealous of Britain. France had never really forgiven, and this was a theme that would come up again and again. France had never forgiven forgiven Britain for winning the war. It sounds like there's so much rage in Macmillan's diaries during these weeks because he, he's getting quite a lot thrown at him. And there's this there's, kind there's of, rage and despair, basically. <laughs> rage and despair. <laughs> and I mean, they're a wonderful read. I mean, I recommend, you know. Oh, really? And I um, recommend Macmillan's diaries all the way through from, I mean, in, there, you know, there are two two volumes which were which have been well edited and um I absolutely recommend. Um, well, we should put a link up to those on our website. I think it's um, like a, a fascinating way of getting inside the political mind. But I, th- I just also want to ask you um, some supplementary questions about this point, because obviously we're talking about the process of joining um, the European community at this very early moment in its history, when you said it was comprised of six, I think, member yeah. states. And we're so used after like the referendum and the rancor of the last five years for these decisions to be made almost by the whole of the nation in a very like kind of um, (laughs) angry way that it seemed strange that you have this process of application to joining just going on between these two individuals, um, Macmillan and de Gaulle. And was the process for joining at that point just a matter of being approved by each of the current member states as it stood and we weren't because um there was a veto that was exercised by de gaulle is that what happened essentially that was the process that the other the other six had to we had to negotiate terms which you know all about this this is all about you know customs duties all the things that we remember (laughs) um from the brexit (laughs) debate and subsidies and the the six governments now that's not to say it was you know the in britain it was you know the, the subject was not was not talked about because it was i mean even then was there a public appetite for joining not particularly but there wasn't a great public attitude either way and um there was a sense i think that rather rather as later and this is why you know this sort of you get through this period, these sort of running sense of sort of deja vu. There was the sense on the right of the Tory party and on the left of the Labour Party. This all sounds very so, familiar. <laughs> so think Boris Johnson or think, think whoever you like on, in the Tory party and Jeremy Corbyn's mm-hmm. sort of section of the Labour Party. Yeah. There was pretty fierce opposition. This is the Enoch um, Powell kind of type. Enoch Powell. Um, these are the backbenchers, the yeah. the the Bill Cashes of the of the uh, late fifties and early sixties. Uh, they called themselves the Suez Group, um, and uh, <laughs> saying that you know our place was in the world, you know, with the Commonwealth, that we weren't, you know, we weren't part of Europe. We were a global power, and then in the Labour Party, you had people on the left, you know, the Peter Shaws and others. Tony Benn actually initially was pro, and then he, he when he was Anthony Wedgwood Benn, he was yeah. um, pro, and then it was Tony Benn <laughs> later became uh, anti. But on the left of the Labour Party, you had, and um, among some of the trade unions, this sense that the common market was basically a capitalist club, and that if we brought down all our trade barriers, these would be used to force down wages and allow the capitalists um, to make more money. So you had quite noisy groups on the right and the left. There was, you know, there was a debate, but I think there was also, this goes back to the sense of modernity, there was a sense that, you know, this was the way that the world was going and, you know, weren't the French doing well, as you know, weren't the Germans doing very well recovering, weren't indeed the Italians 
um, doing well. So I think there was, again, and in our, in our relationship with Europe, there's always been this sense of, on the one hand, superiority, we're better, but also, hang on, we can't let them run away from us. Yeah, you know, we, exactly. We've got to be part of that club. Uh, and Macmillan had gone softly, softly, and he, he'd won over the Tory party over a period of about 18 months. So had de Gaulle not vetoed, we would have gone in and it would have been quite straightforward, but it wouldn't have been without any noise whatsoever. Hello, it's Peter. If you're enjoying this conversation about political life in the early 1960s, then you might like to have a look at one of Colourgraph's latest productions. The image is made from a black and white photograph of Jack Kennedy that was taken in November 1963. It shows Kennedy surrounded by the top brass of the US Navy watching the launch of the Polaris rocket. It's a powerful piece of work. The president looks so vividly young and alive in his teal blue suit. And of course, it's all the more compelling because we know what happened so shortly afterwards. This image of JFK is one of a series that Colourgraph have been making for us. Portraits of the Beatles and Oscar Wilde, pictures of NASA and NASA's research facilities, images of the snowy lanes in the cold winter of 1960. These and hundreds more images are now available to buy as museum grade prints at Colourgraph.co. Made in Britain to the highest production standards, its history at its most provoking and striking. They make amazing and unusual presents for anyone who's interested in the past and travels through time listeners get money off too. Just use the discount code TTT at the checkout. That's a really fascinating overview. What do they say? History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. I think that's it a good rhyme. A, it certainly rhymes. <laughs> it's rhyming very well in in this particular scene. Brilliant. Okay, let's go to the third because there's a contrast here, and it's um, equally interesting and equally like enmeshed in this idea of um, geopolitics. Yeah. Well, the third, um, and this is you know Macmillan's busy month, having got back from. Uh, Rambouillet. Macmillan has two or three days in London, and by the 19th of December, he's heading to Nassau in the Bahamas, where he's to meet the young Jack Kennedy for a two, three day summit. There are lots of things on the agenda, but there's one, as far as Macmillan and Britain is concerned, uh, there's one really important thing. Will the Americans supply Britain with its next generation of new nuclear carrying missiles, uh, what became the Polaris missile. There's a whole chapter on this in the book. It's and it seems to be an absolute obsession with many British politicians, this desire to have a nuclear capability. It starts with actually um with Attlee's government after the war. And it was Ernest Bevan, the foreign secretary, who uh, swung the argument. There were some fairly brutal arguments because the Treasury thought it was too expensive. To quote him said, you know, sort of he's a, a rather outspoken former trade union leader. And Bevin said, we've got to have this thing over here, whatever it costs. We've got to have a bloody union jack on it. And this was the sense that the only way that we could assert real independence and status was if we we uh, follow the Americans into the nuclear club. And of course, we knew that the Soviet Union were developing their um, nuclear weapons. So we had to be part of the club. And the deterrent or nuclear weapons as an emblem of our national status, our position in the world, have been has been an absolutely unbreakable thread uh, hmm. through our post-war politics. Right through to David Cameron and Trident in 2016. And it'll, Absolutely. it'll recur again, won't it, whenever there's, well, there's a need. Well, in fact, though, you know, Trident is due, the new Trident is due to stay in operation until 2060, I think. And I would argue that the decision taken in 1962 by Macmillan and Kennedy locked us into a position which other things being equal and we don't know you know what might happen before 2060 but if we keep it to 2060 that'll be on the basis of a decision taken by Macmillan and Kennedy in the Bahamas in mm -hmm. December of 1962. 
Now, there aren't that many decisions as consequential um, as that. In which case, I think we should do it, it full justice by explaining just what happened at this meeting between Kennedy and Macmillan. They, uh, they had, I think I should start off by asking you, kind of interesting personal question because they had a good chemistry even though they were quite uh, an unlikely couple um they did get on well i mean it had helped that jack kennedy had been in london in the late 30s where his father had been the ambassador and jack had been you know had mixed in the same circles as it were as the macmillans um in the late 30s and sort of tory high society during the Cuban crisis, where Kennedy, you know, was facing some quite difficult confrontations with his own generals and his own political advisers, um, Macmillan had played it very well. He hadn't tried to to lecture Kennedy. You know, Kennedy called a number of number of occasions, but had positioned himself as someone that Kennedy could bounce ideas off and ask for advice. So there was a certain amount of of um, of real trust uh, in the relationship. The really crucial thing in this was that um, uh, during, you know, we'd built our bomb and we'd then built our H-bomb. Um, so we were part of the nuclear uh, race as it were, and we had our Vulcan bombers um, uh, to, to take these things if they ever needed to be taken, um, uh, to be dropped on Moscow and, uh, uh, other Russian cities. But by the early 60s, the whole world had changed. Um, Sputnik and um, space had revolutionized um, uh, defense strategic policy. And it became it would become clear that uh, in future, nuclear weapons would be carried essentially on rockets rather than in bomb bays. And that planes were there to be shot down rockets uh, far more dangerous and difficult um, to stop. This was very expensive. And here again, one of those occasions where our overseas ambitions or our great power ambitions collided with our straightened economic circumstance because we didn't have the money. There were constant battles with the treasury. The initial plan or, or, or the initial arrangement was, and this was fortuitous for, for Britain, is that the Americans had develop the Polaris submarine based nuclear system and they needed a base in Europe. And a deal was done by Macmillan whereby the Americans were allowed to establish a base in Holy Lock in Scotland where they could service and refuel Polaris. And in return, uh, the Americans would uh, sell us some rockets that they were developing they were air uh, rockets fired by uh, from the air by planes which we would use um, to deliver our deterrent but 1962 the whole thing began to unravel because the american rocket wasn't working or it seemed unlikely that it was going to work and so we were committed to buy something which the pentagon was already beginning to think that they, they might cancel. And we had nothing. This left us with nothing. So when Macmillan went, uh, went to Nassau, he went there with this you know, supreme uh, ambition, which was to persuade Kennedy to sell us Polaris. And Kennedy went with a White House and State Department trying to persuade him not to sell the UK Polaris. There were, he was surrounded by a raft of advisors who said, you know, if he sold Polaris to us, it would encourage proliferation. And much better if, if we lost our nuclear deterrent, and then the Americans could then engineer a, a European-wide deterrent, which could be shared with the French and the Germans and everyone else. Could I just interject here, because I think there's an interesting point you bring out in the book, which is the way we tend to think about these political summits nowadays is as a kind of showpiece. So often much of the discussion has been done, the agreements have been made, and you get everyone together to have a, a nice meal and have the, the photograph. It seems to me in your description of what happened here at this time, this was 
like a very uncertain outcome as they entered the negotiations. It was absolutely uncertain. And summits then, as you, you rightly say, were not, particularly summits when it's two leaders, but often when there were three or four, they, could, they were two-day or three-day working affairs. Um, the press were there, but they were kept at some distance. And you know, the debate over Polaris in the meeting itself in different in different sessions took several hours and Macmillan's point was basically this that if he didn't get Polaris or something and uh, there wasn't anything obvious an obvious alternative he'd probably have to resign because um, Britain would effectively lose a working nuclear deterrent so at one point says to Kennedy, you know, and do you want the, you know, do you want the, do you want Labour in power? Do you want these anti, you know, this anti-nuclear party in power? Because that's what might happen. Meanwhile, as I say, um, Kennedy's people are saying, and, you know, look, we, we, you know, we can't have everyone, you know, we can't have the Europeans have, you know, the Brits having the bomb. They knew the French were developing their own. And then the big fear was, well, if France gets it, then how long before Germany which had already recovered a lot of its economic power, how long before Germany says, well, we're going to go nuclear. And that was a, that was a really real and significant fear in Washington. And in the end, Macmillan got Polaris, but he got it with strings attached, as it were. Uh, Kennedy overruled his own staff and said, yes, um, Britain could buy the Polaris weapon system. So we bought the missile systems and we, uh, to which to put our own warheads. But, and here was the, here was the American con construct to pay more, a little bit more than lip service to the idea of a single European deterrent. Macmillan agreed that the Polaris system, Britain's Polaris system would come under the command of NATO. So it would be part of the Western Alliance defense system. And after a lot of toing and froing and arguments over words and phrases, uh, the agreement was this is an alliance which would be deployed under the command of NATO, except in circumstances of extreme national emergency, in which case, Britain could take it back under its own command. So independent or not independent? You can spin it both ways, which is what politicians do. I mean, as you've been describing this, Macmillan, you have to say, um, went in with a pretty poor hand, but came out with as, as good a result as he could have uh, managed. Is that right? Is that as a good summary, would you say? I think that's right. I think in terms of, if you measure it just in terms of a sort of an exercise in states, you know, the exercise of statesmanship and winning uh, the argument, you could, you would say, I think that Macmillan uh, won and various of, um, of Kennedy's aides who've been on the other side were subsequently um, accepted that uh, uh, Macmillan had, you know, outplayed them. On the other hand, you know, you could say, well, why is it that when anyone, when any British politician talks about the British nuclear uh, weapon, or the British deterrent, they always preface it with the word independent. You know, the, the French, when they talk about the force de frappe, they don't say the French independent deterrent. And the fact that we that politicians ever since have had to had to underline uh, this sense that it's independent um, tells you uh, that there's at least an ambiguity there. But what he'd done, and this is why I think this is such a consequential meeting, he'd constructed a sort of psychological prison for every one of his successors. Mm -hmm. So having, you know, having made so much about this, you know, the need for us to have this deterrent, uh, 
when he left office, who was going to be the prime minister who would now give all this up? So in, in my view, um, you know, some people would think it's a good thing. Um, Macmillan was basically committing us to nuclear weapons for an, at least another 50, 60. And, you know, if the present Trident system were to go until 2060, it would be for nearly 100 years. It goes right to the centre of this thing that you're grappling with in the book, which is Britain's sense of itself. What can it give away and what can it gain? and What things does it need to be able to stand tall? And it seems, <laughs> to be honest, that it seems to need these, these nuclear um, warheads to be able to do that. And uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating... They are, and, and these missiles now haven't been targeted since 1994 so you know put aside these this sort of suggestion that they're prowling the seas and ready to fire you know a few minutes notice if if boris um, johnson gives the order um they're not targeted um it would take days if not weeks to actually target them it would then require the americans to help us do it uh, would require us to persuade the Americans that this was a sufficient national emergency um, that we should have control, take control from NATO. And in the end, and in the book, I quote um, Peter Westmacott, who was the ambassador in Washington uh, when David Cameron uh, negotiated the, uh, uh, the latest... Uh, uh, modernization program for Trident and us, our purchase of the latest Trident. And, you know, while remaining loyal, what Peter Westmacott says is, look, you know, it's a sort of rum thing that we've, you know, the purpose of having an independent deterrent is really to, as an insurance policy um, against, you know, the Americans not coming to defend us in a time of need. But we've taken out an insurance policy against the Americans not helping us, but we can only use it if the Americans agree that we can use it. So it's a very odd construct now that, you know, I put the, the these new aircraft carriers in the, in the same bracket that um, they're what's called, um, I can't name them unfortunately, but a very senior military official uh, in this country once said to me was that we have, that we, we set up our armed forces as if we're a pocket superpower. Instead of spending, you know, on sort of useful things um, that might be used in small conflicts here or there, we, we have to pretend that we have what the military types call full spectrum capability. And that's what a superpower has. A superpower has a capacity to do sort of anything anywhere. And that's what we're, we're pretending that we can still do that. When in truth, you know, we can, we can only fight wars now, anything, you know, any serious war uh, with the Americans. But, you know, the, the politician who stands up and says, you know, we should give up our nuclear weapons, I fear would still be howled down even now as, you know, someone who would, you know, be giving up our, our defences. And yet, if you talk to the people who run our defence strategy, they will openly say, well, if we didn't have it, we wouldn't, certainly wouldn't buy it or try to reinvent it. But then the final thing, and this is where there is a, this is where the Rambouillet and Nassau sort of come together, as it were, because... What NASA does and our purchase of Polaris is, of course, it confirms de Gaulle in his judgment that basically we are, you know, the Trojan horse for the Americans and we are prisoners of the Americans. And in fact, Kennedy offers the same deal to de Gaulle um, in the hope that, you know, he could, he can sort of contain France's program, you know, to develop its own independent, really independent. But de Gaulle says no. And what Nassau does is to give him the excuse to say, look, you know, it is blindingly obvious that 
while the rest of us, we six, are in Europe to build Europe, Britain is still enthralled to Washington and will never show the same enthusiasm and energy in developing Europe. And of course, you could say, given the events of 2016, maybe de Gaulle was right. Now, I was thinking, reading through, that the, when you kind of explain de Gaulle's vision of Europe, it seems like we are returning to that kind of vision now, in a way, and it's almost Europe becoming this purer version of itself, in a way, without the kind of yeah. odd, oddness of Britain tacked on to the edge, which... Um, is a thought which we can leave suspended in the air. This has been a fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot and the book is so well researched and nimbly written and more than anything, absolutely timely for anyone who's like, I suppose in, in our own little ways, we're all trying to make sense of these conundrums and, uh, and they will continue, but the book is a wonderful contribution. Listen, I've got one question I want to ask you before we finish, and we ask it of everyone who comes on, and it's a fun one, I hope. I hope you're not going to pick a nuclear warhead or something like this, but we'll, we'll, we'll see where we get to. If you could bring one tangible memento back from 1962 to have with you today, what would you like? Well, I've, I've thought hard, and well, this is going to sound rather boring, but um, what I'd like is the original of Ashton's speech. Okay. Because I think in that speech, or in those half a dozen sentences, the whole agony, struggle, conflict, which has surrounded our attempt to settle our place in the world, are summarized. So I would like that, and I would um, frame it and put it on my wall. Brilliant. Really good choice. Philip Stevens, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for coming on Travels Through Time. Thank you. It's been absolutely fascinating for me and enjoyable. Thank you, Peter. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Philip Stevens about Britain alone, a brilliantly analysed look at Britain's complex post-war history. It's full of fascinating new research. But today's episode with an old Etonian prime minister, a new US president and an exasperated European Union will also have reminded you of that fine old phrase, plus ça change. To win one of the two copies we have to give away of Britain alone, just head to our website and make sure you're signed up to our newsletter. We'll make the draw on Sunday night, which is the 28th of February. Also make sure you visit our website to see the fascinating colourised image of John F. Kennedy. It's taken just a week before his assassination in Dallas and it's compelling to look at him gazing out into that bright blue Florida sky. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please do let us know with a review if you did. After three weeks in the 1960s, we're off to the Renaissance next week with Violet Moller, who's sitting down with the author Mary Hollingsworth. Until then, thank you for listening. Goodbye.